for me, there isn't more fear or more nerves knowing that it's a bare knuckle match. Um, there's a sense of relief lifted knowing that taking away the wrestling, which has kind of been, you know, known as my downfall in the UFC. PVZ in the house. Yeah, how's it going? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for uh, making the time to do this. Uh, you've got a lot going on right now, so I appreciate you carving out a little bit of time for this. For sure, thank you. You're, you're, you know, you're getting ready for a big fight. You're getting ready for this big fight. I mean, as we speak right now, it's about, it's about a week away. How are you feeling? I feel great, honestly. Yeah, we're one week out. Um, it's crazy. It, even if right now it feels like the biggest fight of my entire career. I feel like the most pressure on me, the most like adrenaline. It feels really good. There's a lot of eyeballs on you for this because I don't know if people expected you at this stage of your career to be going into bare knuckle. This, no, I mean, they didn't. And I feel like that was a little bit a part of my appeal to go to bare knuckle because I knew it would make some big waves. I knew I was going to shock a lot of people by signing with them over, you know, other organizations. And I, I definitely think I did that. So what, what do your days look like right now? I'm imagining that you probably just trained a few hours ago and here we are squeezing this in. Yes. So days right now. So typically leading up to the fight all the way from like eight weeks out, I'm training anywhere from two to three times a day. And then as it gets a little closer, now that I'm getting my weight down, it's very like specific training. Um, and then of course, lots of cardio, lots of getting the weight in check and then making sure I'm staying as safe as possible in training too, to not get like injured before the fight. So super specific training right now. So you've relocated to Florida is, is training in Florida any different? You know what? That was one of my questions going into like, it's very um, humid. I used to live there. It is very humid here, but honestly the training, like it's really, it's almost comforting to know that. The training here, I'm training just as hard as I ever have. Um, but now it's like I have the high level coaching, like extremely high level coaches in this industry that I've trained champions. Now they're going to be in my corner. They're my coaches. They're getting me ready for whatever happens. So it's a, a really big confidence booster, I would say, being at such a high level gym. And how different does training look getting ready for a bare knuckle fight versus getting ready for an MMA fight? It's a big difference, I will <laughs> say. I almost like this training better though. This is something that I've talked to Tiago Alves with. He's fight. He also fights for bare knuckle and he's my teammate and one of my coaches and corners. And, you know, he has said, you know, his body almost feels better just doing boxing because it's the grappling and the wrestling where you feel like you cannot walk after practice. There are certain things and like certain, like you'll get yourself in like different entanglements and you'll get like stretched out in these crazy positions. Whereas in boxing, you're not doing that. So I do feel like my body, I can push so much harder when it's just boxing. Do you remember what the first bare, bare knuckle fight that you watched was and what your reaction was to it? Yes. So actually the first bare knuckle match that I watched was for BKFC. I was curious about um, Beck Rawlings, one of my old opponents, in the UFC going into it and I watched her fight and I was like, holy cow, this is like, this is legit. This is awesome. And, and this is going to be you now. Is there, are there, are there any fears as you go into this fight? Of course there's the fear, there's fear, you know, there's general nerves, but it's, it's the exact same as going into any fight. For me, there isn't more fear or more nerves knowing that it's a bare knuckle match. Um, there's a sense of relief lifted knowing that taking away the wrestling, which has kind of been, you know, known as my downfall in the UFC is my wrestling never really was up to par. Whereas now I don't necessarily have to worry about that. So it, it is a sense of relief in that sense, but I also put the exact same amount of pressure on myself for every fight. So same, same nerves, same like nervous energy. But I imagine most of the training you're doing, most of the sparring you're doing, you're wearing some sort of gloves, right? Yes, most of the time. So all sparring, we wear gloves always. Um, for different like pad sessions, we'll actually take the gloves off and go bare knuckle just to, you want to be able to feel what it's going to feel like when you hit somebody. It's not going to be a shock to your hands, a shock to you. Um, so it's very specific training. And I'm super fortunate that I'm at a gym with coaches who I don't have to think about those things. They thought it through for me. I just do what they say and they kind of have prepared the way for me. I'm not the first person from my gym to compete for BKFC. So it's kind of, we, we have a cool little program going on. 
So if we take this back page, who was Paige Van Zandt before you found fighting? Oof. Okay. I was talking to somebody about this today. What did I do before fighting? Um, I was a dancer. Um, I danced. I was always very competitive. I was still the same athlete. I had the same drive. It was just in a different sport. So competitive dancing, super driven at that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, before fighting, I don't know, I guess I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And now I feel like I finally do. What did you think you were going to be? I didn't know. You know, I went to college early, which was, I was, you know, super gifted academically, which was great, but I didn't know what to apply that in. So in college, I went to college when I was 16. And what? yeah, I went to college. Oogie Hauser over here. But it didn't mean anything because I changed my major four times. So within that time, I went from um, a nursing major, culinary arts, physical education and business I is what I ended on. So I kind of, I didn't know what I, I, I knew I was passionate about a lot of things, but I didn't know what I really wanted to do. Yeah. You really ran the gamut of like the possible career options. I here. did, but you know, looking back at it now, you know, I was in the like physical education, which is what I do. I did culinary arts. I've been on chopped the cooking show so I've been able to like kind of touch upon each of the different majors that I thought I would go into. I skipped one grade. So I feel like we have that in common. I skipped one grade. Uh, and I went uh, to college one year early, but I, I can't imagine going, I guess you would have been three years early. No, it was just two years for oh, me. Just two whatever, years. whatever the cutoff was, I was just two years early. <laughs> So when everybody else is being able to, well, I guess they're not able to drink really for many years, but they're, they're like just at a different, you might be at the same level as them academically, but socially, maybe you're not. No, I was really lucky. I actually went to, I went to, it was like a community college program. So I wasn't at a university. It wasn't that kind of like environment, which was nice. It was a very like, I feel like community college is like a more focused environment. Everyone's just kind of does their own thing. Um, so I don't know how many people actually knew I was in high school technically by age. I don't think people really knew. It's a, probably, you probably weren't telling people either, which is, you know. No, I kept that a secret. <laughs> right. And hunting, hunting's a big part of you, your, you know, time growing up as well. What specifically were you hunting for? You know what? And this is funny. I, hunting, like people think it's, think it's hunting, but actually my grandparents were managers of a gun range. So I did most of my shooting at a gun range, not okay. actually hunting for animals. So it was, I was on a shooting team in middle school for a little while. It was mostly target, target hunting. So what kind of guns were you shooting? Um, so when I was in uh, middle school, they were called air rifles. And then I've shot, I pretty much shot everything, shotguns. We, when your grandparents manage a gun club, you shoot everything. But you have been hunting, right? No, I haven't. Really? <laughs> no, and you know what? I. And this is embarrassing because my friend's oh, no. 12 gauge, but I don't know that I could kill anything. I truly don't. I don't know that I could take the life of an animal. I And I am extremely tough. And if it came down to it, if I needed to, I guess I go fishing if that counts, but. I'm, I'm big into fishing. I'm, I yeah. do a lot of bass fishing. So I'm with you on that. Yes. And my, you know, my family, my husband's family is all from Alaska. So they hunt for moose every season because that's the, the meat they eat all year long that's what it's for. So, um, maybe if it came down to that, but well, I like to about, drive the four wheeler and look cute. The thing about fishing is it can be catch and release hunting. You know, you can't really, you know, shoot know. them and then let them I'm go. I'm such an animal lover. And that would be like the hardest part is so I'm not, yeah, I can shoot a target though. You need me to shoot somebody robbing my house. They're done for it. <laughs> I feel like maybe that there's some similarities between shooting at a range growing up and the accuracy and all the things that go into that and what you're doing now for a living. Oh, absolutely. I think a lot of stuff like going into like shooting and stuff, but it's a lot more patience, but at the same time, you have to be really like analytical and thoughtful and, and in fighting, you have to, you have to be patient picking your shots. It's a little bit more obviously high paced it, most of the time, but it's still, it's that sense of patience and technique. So you mentioned Alaska and I was watching your YouTube channel and yep. your YouTube channel is called a kick-ass love story with Paige and Austin. I'll link to it down below if people want to subscribe to you, <laughs> but you guys were just in Alaska. We were. So we actually, before COVID, we would go back to Alaska probably three to four times a year. Um, that's like our second home. So we think we're going to have a home in Florida and one in Alaska. So like the best of both worlds. Wow. Yeah. We absolutely love it there. And we went there for Thanksgiving. 
So what city specifically is he from? All right. I'm going to see if you can say it. He is from Ninelchik. Ninelchik? Ninelchik. Ninelchik, Alaska. It's technically just a fishing village. So he's from a village, grew up in the middle of nowhere. And he doesn't like brag about himself enough, but he uh, was the only person on his high school wrestling team. And then went on to college to become a national champion. Oh, the only, I thought you were going to say the only person on his high school wrestling team. And then there was going to be an end to that there sentence, was, but it was. No, that was it. <laughs> that was it. And then went on to become a national champion in college. Like, wow. Crazy. You know, lots of dedication, especially coming from such a small town. Who do you, who can you, who do you wrestle when there's no one else on the team to wrestle? I think his coach. And then you like fly around to different like villages and wrestle, wow. with, other wrestle with other teams. And stuff like that, yeah. So I've been on an Alaskan cruise, but I feel like that doesn't count as saying I've been to Alaska. It doesn't, it doesn't. I don't know. I haven't been on a cruise yet, but I will say being in Alaska, like I had never been there until my husband took me. And uh, I was like, okay, let's just move here. Let's live here forever. It's absolutely amazing. Besides like I would miss like training and everything. So Best of both worlds, we're going to spend our like relaxing time there. And then Florida's all business. I mean, you truly do have the best of both worlds. It's like crazy hot in Florida. The winters are crazy cold in Alaska. Yes, the best. When we left Alaska for Thanksgiving, I think it was like 10 degrees. And then we show up like the same day flying from Alaska to Florida and it was 80 here. Wow. What? Big so difference. So if he was uh, on the high school wrestling team, were you on any high school teams? Yes. My freshman year, I was a cheerleader. Right. And then my uh, freshman and then sophomore year, I ran cross country. And then my junior and senior, I went to college. So I only was able to play like high school sports two years. So where did the introduction to MMA come in? That came. So I actually grew up in Oregon. And then yeah. my family and I moved to Nevada for my dad's job. And he was a huge fan of Ken Shamrock, who, you know, legend in-, in He's the been MMA. on the show many times, yeah. Yeah, legend. So my dad, being a really big fan of his, was like, hey, there's this like, there's this legend, he's a fighter, like he's a gym here, can we go try it? So my dad actually did my first class with me. He was my drilling partner. I did, got to heel hook him, I got to choke him. And I like fell in love with fighting. I was 15 years old. And Ken at the time, which was, you know, I picked up a few things pretty easy just because I was, I had such a, like a technique driven dance background. And Ken was like, Hey girl, you, you could be good at this if you stick to it. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to stick to it. So Ken was actually there from like day one. Ken was there day one. And I had no idea who he was like, no idea. And now looking back, I'm like, holy cow, my first coach was a legend, like a legend in the sport. Like that doesn't happen. So especially like in Reno, Nevada, like a small town, it's not very well known. So yeah, Reno, Nevada had Ken Shamrock as my first ever MMA coach. So you were just like, who's this incredibly jacked guy? Yes, he comes in, he is jacked and he like, he Ken has his like persona, I think for camera and for like, for who he is, but he kind of carried that on the mat too. Like he knew he was a badass and just walking in and it was his gym and he was there to teach you and you better listen. Is there anything that Ken taught you early on that you still apply to your training or to your fights now? Absolutely. My heel hooks and, and I don't do them as much in fights. I, I went for a heel hook at like the last 10 seconds when I fought, um, Felice Herrig. I like tried to jump for a, for a leg walk, but there's certain positions you don't want to necessarily put yourself in a bad spot in MMA, but in straight jujitsu, my heel hooks are like really good still, just because that's the first thing I learned and I've always been passionate about it. So my, my leg locks are still dangerous. Is Ken still in, are you still in touch with Ken? You know what? I actually did talk to him on, on the phone not that long ago. Um, and then, uh, you know, he has a son and we were the same age. So we communicate every now and then, but it, it's definitely been a while, but yeah, I would say me and Ken still have a great relationship. So where, do you remember what your first UFC fight was that you ever watched or you were you know exposed to? Yes. I think the first UFC fight I've ever Maybe it wasn't the first one I watched. The first one I paid attention to. Okay. Um, the first one, because my dad has been a UFC fan since day one, forever. Yeah. Because he's a, he's a wrestler, you know, he was a high school wrestler. 
And so when I went, um, when we lived in Reno, my dad's like, Hey, we got to go, we got to go watch some fights. So there was a UFC card on and the first ever fight I paid attention to, I know Forrest Griffin was the main event. And so he was my like fight idol and forever. He was the one I looked up to was Forrest Griffin. So you, you know, you start training with Shamrock when you're 15, which is mind blowing by the way, yeah. you're training with like a hall of famer. How does it turn from just training to going, I think that I want to try my first amateur fight? It didn't take long. You know, it, it kind of went from, well, I guess 15 and you could, I couldn't take an amateur fight until I was 18. Okay. So 18 comes and, um, you know, I actually, Ken had closed his gym in Reno when I was training at another local gym and they were like, Hey, we have this, we put on our own show. Do you want to fight? And it's like, sure. I'll take a fight. I, I took a fight. I did a mate. I, was hooked. I ended up submitting the girl in like 40 seconds. Um, and then the funniest part though, is that was only, I think a month after my 18th birthday. And then I get a call a few weeks later and this girl wanted a fight for her pro debut. She was already really well known as an amateur. And I was like, yeah, I'll take it. And I think I got like $800. And, uh, my coach actually told me, he's like, you shouldn't take it. I mean, once you're a pro, you can't go back. He's like, it's my job. Someone offered it to you. But if you take it, like you can't be an amateur ever again. And I was like, oh, well, I need the money. I'm in college already. Let's go. And uh, I flew out there just myself and one of my teammates and ended up winning my pro debut out of nowhere. And that was the moment I was like, I'm a pro fighter. I am done with school. This is what I do now. Yeah. And how long after that did Dana White and the UFC come calling? Only maybe three fights later. This is insane, by the way. Yeah, I was so, which is funny because it just turned 18. I turned, went amateur and pro right away. I was signed to the UFC by the time I was 19. Yeah, well, again, this is insane and amazing. <laughs> it was really amazing. It was very fast. And obviously I had an amazing career with the UFC. I, I loved every second. I had my first fight with them when I was 20. So Signed when I was 19, um, first fight when I was 20, and now 26, I guess I had my last fight with them. And I'm a professional bare knuckle boxer. When you sign with UFC at 19 and you're a huge fan of MMA, yep. do you just go, I'm going to be in UFC forever? You no, know, you know what? Not at all. When I had first signed the contract to be in the UFC. And um, how many fights was that contract? That was four. It was a four okay. fight contract. And I signed the contract and, you know, I was talking to my parents and I was obviously very nervous and it was kind of like a moment where I was like, all right, I might be terrible at this. I don't know. Like it's all happening. It was just all happening so fast. And I was like, I'm going to treat this. Like I get one shot, like this will be my only fight for the UFC ever. That's what I thought. I was like, you know what? They might hate me. They might cut me. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I, I treated it as like, I only had one opportunity to prove to the UFC that I belonged and I was got Gosh, I got a fight of the night bonus against um, Kaylin Curran. It was another UFC fighter. And we put on an amazing show and changed my life. I'll, I'll never forget the fight where you broke your arm. And then you go back to your corner and you're like, yeah, I think I just broke my arm. And then you keep fighting. Yeah. You know what? I talk about that with my husband a lot because he was in my corner. And I have now broken my arm three times. <laughs> Um, and I separated my shoulder not that long ago and, um, before my last UFC fight. And I was like, Hey, I like each instance, I'm like, Hey, I broke my arm. And he's like, no, you, you would be crying. You're fine. I'm like, no, I know my body. I know my arm is broken. And every time my arm has been broken. And then I separated my shoulder and I was like, I need to go to the hospital. And he's like, no, if I've separated my shoulder and you'd be like screaming in pain. I was like, no, I think it's hurt separated. So it was always, there's little, little things, but yes, broke my arm in the middle of the fight and my corners did not believe me. But I would think, you know, it probably hurt, you know, like an eight out of 10 when it broke. And then after the fight was over and then you get to the back and the adrenaline wears off, I can only imagine what it feels like then. Absolutely. In the middle of the fight, I could feel like, Cause I have like a bouncy, like fight style. Yeah. Every time I would move my arms, I could feel my bone clicking. Oh in, like, my God. Front. It was disgusting. And I could keep hearing my corner is like, right, throw your right, throw your right. And I was like, did you guys not listen? Like, I just told you I broke my arm, but I, I decided to throw it anyways. And it 
hurt terribly, but yeah, after the adrenaline wore off, it hurt even more. It was absolutely crazy. Are you, do you have any like fear, any trepidations going into your first bare knuckle fight that you're not going to just maybe break your arm? Maybe you'll break, you know, bones in your hand as well. You know what? And I've thought about that. Hands don't hurt as bad as arms. And I know that I fought through an entire five minutes, which is basically like two and a half bare knuckle rounds. I fought five whole minutes plus half of the second round. So like seven minutes with a totally broken arm. So if I can do that, then if I break a knuckle, if I break a piece of my hand in the middle of a fight, I know I'm going to be fine. And I know I'm going to keep fighting. I guess more than anything, what worries me is like, the things you can't control. Like if you get cut open and then a doctor stops the fight, that would be yeah. very disappointing. I think a lot of your fans are very concerned about like you taking punches to your face. And after you signed, all these people were like tweeting these photos a- a- at you of yeah. like some of the other bare knuckle fighters. What was your reaction to seeing that? You know what? And I've thought about this and there's risks in, in every career you have. Like of course. My- my risk one is getting my face cut open, but I would rather have, you know, that's for 10 minutes, put my life in danger versus for my entire life, live, a, live a life. That's not fulfilled. That's not fun. That's not enjoyable where I don't get to like live life to the fullest. I would much rather risk these 10 minutes than risk living a boring life. I love that. I, and it's so true. Like yeah. now you could, you can never say what if. No, I can never say what if, and I know faces heal. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll get arthritis in my hands. Yeah. But if I sat behind a desk all day, I'd probably get arthritis too. I might as well like (laughs) do this where 10 minutes I get just complete glory. And then I get to, you know, live the rest of my life and travel and, and experience like a life I'm truly passionate about. And I would, I would risk cutting my face off for all of this. Well, no, you're not going to do that. We don't need to do that. Not all of it. (laughs) I think everyone just kind of assumed, you know, Austin, your husband's in Bellator. I think a lot of people just assumed that you would take a Bellator contract. Was that something that you were interested at looking at? Yes. Honestly, I thought when I was leaving the UFC that I would immediately sign with Bellator. I, I truly did. I thought that they would have the best offer. I thought that was where my heart was. You know, they treat my husband so well. And the idea of competing on the same card or the same organization as him was really exciting. But then bare knuckle came along and it was like, they, I don't know. It's like, I had the angel and the devil on my shoulder, like this one in my ear, like, well, this one I'm more passionate about. And, but, but this one I would get to compete with my husband. And, um, for me, I had to go where the passion lied. And the one that excited me the most at that moment in time was bare knuckle and, I just, I wanted to shock the world. I wanted to prove how tough I am. And, and I just, it, it seems fun. There's, you're also like, there's an element of this contract where you're doing some commentary too. Yeah. So they actually opened it up to where I can commentate. It's a, it's a kind of an open-ended contract. I'm, a, I'm definitely a, a BKFC fighter, but they're giving me the freedom to pursue other things if I want to. So I'm locked into them for, for one aspect, but I can also do, I think I can take an MMA fight if I want to. There's like, there's things I can do that will help build me as a brand, but also help build them since I'm, you know, a part of their company. So if you feel like your heart's really pulling you in that direction, that you're super passionate about bare knuckle, how do you break this to your husband? It was not good. (laughs) So it was, it was hard. It was, I would say it was a hard two days where he was really mad at me because I kind of put my foot down and, or I didn't put my foot down. He, he knew where I wanted to go and he knew at the end of the day, I was going to sign with bare knuckle boxing and, and he was just upset. Like it wasn't, it was, there were so many layers to the reason like, yeah, it seemed more dangerous and, and yeah, I don't get to fight as the same organization. We had kind of looked forward to that for so long because he was on um, the Dana White contender series and right. he went on and had this spectacular finish and we thought he was going to get signed to the UFC and he didn't. And that's when I was like, you know, got this, like, I got so bitter about it because he deserves it so much. And then Bellator came around and, you know, he was upset because we really loved the idea of being on the same card together, but now he's fully come around and is extremely supportive of all of it. And, He's, he's super excited for, for my first fight. 
If someone's about to watch, I love the name of this, Knuckle Mania. This is amazing. Knuckle Mania. Knuckle yeah. Mania. It's Super Bowl weekend. Uh -huh. it, if someone's going into this and they maybe haven't seen one of your fights, which one of your previous fights should they put on that will really showcase what you can do in bare knuckle? Okay, that's a good one. Um, of course, performance wise, I want them to see uh, me versus like Felice Herrig or me versus Beck Rawlings or me versus Alex Chambers. But I think the fight that proves how tough I am is actually a fight that I lost. And that was against Rose Namajunas. You know, she was a UFC champion, extremely tough. We went five full rounds and yeah, she put it to me. It was a war. But in that fight, I feel like I proved how tough I was. I got cut open in the first round. There's blood everywhere. And I fought through every second of that fight. What did you learn mentally from a loss like that? I think I learned how tough I was. Um, I, or maybe I knew how tough I was. I think the world like learned how mm. tough I was. It was like, finally, I was able to prove like I would be, I, you could put me through hell and I'm not going to quit. And um, I think it just proved that, you know, throughout there, you're going to have ups and downs in your career, but it's always always about just like going out there and fighting for yourself. I mean, you always hear fighters talk about how you learn more from your losses than you do from your wins. Is that yeah. actually true? It's hard to say that. I mean, you do in a sense. Um, I think why that's true is because after you win, not a lot of people go back and reevaluate the performance and say, all right, I did this wrong. I did this wrong. And this is how I can better myself. Yeah. When you lose, you really take a step back and reevaluate and try to figure out why. And you make the changes to make yourself better. When you win, you don't necessarily make those changes to have growth. And um, so, yeah, you can technically learn more, I think, from a loss, although um, winning feels so much better. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've got so much going on. I mean, this is obviously a huge fight, but you've got so much going on outside of bare knuckle as well. Like Paige Van Zandt is a brand now. And do you remember when like you went from just being like a fighter to being like an Instagram influencer, like on that next level? Yeah, I don't know. And I don't even see myself as an Instagram influencer. I just feel like I share my life and my love for the world and people enjoy watching it. And maybe that's what an influencer is. I don't know. Um, no, I don't know what really like for me, I just feel like a regular person, especially walking into like a gym, like American top team, when there's so many people that are way more successful than me. Um, it's hard to feel big. It's hard to have an ego when you're surrounded by like Amanda Nunes. She's a double champ. Like when she walked in, like me and my husband, like whispered to each other, like, oh, there's the goat. There she is. Like she's here. So it's like, being around that high level of talent, it is really hard to see myself as special. But you probably get messages every day from girls that look up to you and they want to do what you do for a living. I do. Yeah. And it, that, that's special. Having people reach out to me that are, um, you know, going through hard times or having, you know, being trying to inspire that like younger female generation is, you know, a lot of reason why I do it all. And a lot of the reason why, like I fight through all the negativity and the hardship. And I, I try to not like respond to hate in a negative way, because that's not what I think I should be teaching people. I think it's about like rising through all the negativity and still being strong and being true to yourself. Yeah, because you're in an occupation where there's a lot of negativity thrown your way. Every, everyone that watches yeah. MMA thinks that they're a fighter. And, you know, a very, as you know, very, very small percentage have actually, you know, taken yeah. a fight. So, you know, you, you put everything on display for the world to see. You go into a fight and if you lose, I'm sure you get all this backlash from people saying, should have done this, shouldn't have done this. Yes. And that's the hard thing about being in MMA or like these individual sports, you know, I feel like because all eyeballs are just on you. You can't necessarily blame like, you know, in a football, in a basketball game, you can't blame just like there's a point guard. There's like all these different positions. It's a full team. Whereas it's so when you lose or when the team loses, the whole team loses. Whereas yeah. if I lose, I only me, nobody yeah. else but me loses. And it's, it is hard. And I do think that fighting because it is, fighting you a lot of people see fighting as like good versus evil and they pick who their superhero is and who the villain is in the fight and those somebody comes out on top 
But, you know, people should see fighting as, like, two superheroes fighting each other. And we're just fighting to see who the better superhero is. It doesn't necessarily have to be negative. We're, we're going out there to have a war with each other. Yeah, UFC has definitely borrowed a lot from WWE. Like, the good yes. guy and the bad guy in every single it's fight. Always, you know, and I had been asked, I was fighting uh, Rachel Ostovich in Brooklyn, and one of the um, media guys was like, Hey, like, how does it feel? You're going to the, you're kind of the villain in this fight. I was like, what? Me? I am never the villain. Like I haven't said a negative thing about a single person I've ever fought. So it's just interesting how there's always kind of that like good versus evil narrative going into fights. And I don't think it needs to be like that. Plus how could you be a villain when you're smiling like 24 seven? That's what I'm saying. I, don't, I was like, come on, guys. You got to think of a better storyline than that. How do you stay so positive? Because your positivity, your smile is just so damn infectious. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. No, I feel like it's easy to be myself. And it's like, obviously, we're talking about me. So it's like, I, you know, feel it makes me feel good. And sure. um, life's too short to be angry all the time. And you know, I could live a very negative life, especially reading the comments and the articles that are written about me. And, and there's, there's a lot of negativity, but I, you know, if you just focus on the good, like if you focus on everything is love around you and, and just soak, soak it all in, enjoy the moment. And remember life is short. And at the end of the day, this is just a job. Was there one specific comment or something that you saw or heard that you were like, you know what, I don't need to deal with this anymore. I'm just not going to read them. Yeah, there are some, um, I can deal with like the occasional like troll and you would kind of expect that, but, um, and this is something I had to learn the people who are hating on you. They're not hating on you because of who you are. They're hating on you because they have hate in their heart. And I had one kid comment on every single one of my pictures, videos, he would DM me and tell me like, Hey, you need to go kill yourself. Like, you need to like constantly tell me to kill myself wow. and like these terrible, terrible things. And finally I just like added them on Instagram. I was like, Hey, what's going on? <laughs> like, why, why, are, why do you hate me? What, what is, what truly has, does this have to do with Yeah. And now we're Instagram friends. And it's so what, where did the conversation go from there? Oh, just curiosity. I was just curious. And then he ended up apologizing and saying, he's really sorry. And a lot of people are just looking for a response yeah. and you know, once you like respond and you validate their comments publicly, I feel like that gives them validation. Whereas if you can, you know, message them in private or, I mean, and some people are just maybe miserable, but I, I truly believe everybody has good in their heart somewhere. And for you to attack somebody that you do not know that you've never met before, it has to stem from something else. And it has to yeah. stem from something inside of you. Well, what he did to you is called bullying. That's what that it is. is. Bullying. It is you, absolutely is. You should have been like, uh, do you know who I am? Like I could I, I could like break your face. Part of me is like, part of me wants to have that reaction immediately. But um, I also know one of the best quotes I've heard was like, you know, nobody doing better than you will put you down or nobody yeah. doing better than you is thinking about you. One of the two. So it's, so, you know, those are obviously people who aren't doing more than I am. Are there ever like girls that have maybe had a, you know, a drink or two, too many and they, you know, run into you and they think that they could like try to start a fight with you at a bar or something? No. And I'm very happy about that because girls aren't like that, which is very nice. But I have been with quite a few of my like fight friends and the guys and yeah, people like to try to challenge them constantly. Has this happened to Austin while you've been there? No, not yet. But I will say Austin is like the peacekeeper and he will make anybody his best friend. So there's people who don't like him or don't like me and now they're best friends and they get a drink. Like it, he can literally befriend everybody. And I say this with great respect. He looks like a fighter. You he don't does. as much look like a fighter. Thank you. He's got the huge cauliflower ear and he's got an eyeball on his throat and covered in tattoos, but he is the more, I would say he's more down to earth than I am. Like if it comes to like road rage or tempers, that's me. What? No way. Absolutely. I have the worst road rage in the world. What is your biggest pet peeve on the road? Biggest pet peeve is when you're in the fast lane 
and there's a car going under the speed limit in the fast lane. Mm -hmm. That mine's, kills me. Mine's when they don't put on the turn signal. Like, come on. Yeah. I'm not a mind too. reader. Come on, man. <laughs> Who was Austin when you first met him? Gosh, you know what? Austin really hasn't changed since I first met him. He's kind of been the same. And of course, I can hear him playing Call of Duty in the background. Oh, if is I he good? I tell him to be quiet, I can. <laughs> no, I can't hear it. It's okay. No, okay, good. He, <laughs> you know, You're about to lay down the law here. I will lay down. I will shut that <laughs> off. No, when we first met, he didn't play video games at all. So his inner nerd definitely has come out a little more. Or he was like trying to like impress me and hide the fact that he plays fantasy football and Call of Duty constantly. He, those didn't come out until after we got married. I mean, those aren't really that nerdy. No, it's not that bad. But like him and his friends, they, they're actually really good at fantasy football. I think they should have like a podcast since they pay attention to it all the time. I think he was in like four or five leagues this year. Oh my God. That is, that is a lot of time. Dedication. Lots of dedication. So what was it like the first time that you guys met? First time that we met. So we had met at a conditioning gym. We were both training in Oregon at the same time at, at this point. And I was already working out and he showed up right after I did. So I was finishing my workout and he walks in and you kind of see, he was kind of like, had a like not country look to him but more like down to earth he looked like um he wasn't know, wearing what, an affliction shirt's what you're saying no he was not wearing an affliction <laughs> shirt which is very good and he was actually wearing socks with flip-flops so he had like he's one of those guys who puts his socks into his flip-flops which is so uncomfortable yeah and, um i saw him I was like i like that guy i like him and it didn't take long before we were in love so you were the one that pursued him i like to say i was the one who pursued him because what it does he like to say he doesn't like to admit that but it is true <laughs> because we had quite a few people at our gym have to tell him like hey she's hitting on you like she's interested in you come on go for it and yeah it took a little while we can definitely hear call of duty now it sounds like quite the game I it's okay so no, it's okay. Is, okay. What do you expect? This is amazing. See, that's his that's his whisper too. He's got his headphones on. Oh my gosh. We're well, we're ruining the game for him. My goodness. I know. It's very intense. You know, I do a lot of interviews with wrestlers and WWE superstars, and I feel like your name just keeps coming up as someone who people think would be great in WWE. You have any interest in doing that? I do, you know, I get asked about WWE a lot, and I, I do feel like I think it's something I would be very good at because I kind of have like the best of both worlds. I was a dancer. I was used to like the entertainment, like the showmanship side of it, all about showmanship. And then, you know, the combat sports world obviously goes into the WWE, but you know, I don't know that it's something that I could do both at the same time. Maybe uh, yeah, I, definitely not. Maybe. I, yeah. You know, I feel like I would want to do that 100%. So maybe it's something that after I'm done fighting, you know, in a cage and in a ring, that kind of stuff. Maybe, maybe I'll go over to there, but you know, we'll see. The door is definitely open. There's been a lot of people who have been very successful to go from UFC or combat sports to WWE. I mean, Brock Lesnar's one of the, one of the greats, Ronda Rousey as well. So like, there's definitely a path there if you want to follow that path. Yeah, there is definitely a path and a communication is actually there sometimes. So we're able to communicate and, and show our interest with each other and, um, you know, once there's a little bit more free time in my schedule, I, I, I think that's something that I would like to really pursue. So this means they've reached out to you at some point. Yes. At some point I have visited their, uh, campus. The here performance in, center. Yes. The performance center. Cause it's up in Orlando. So I was yeah. able to go visit and look around and kind of get a sense for what it's all about. I feel like we are foreshadowing the future now. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you, you've got, you've got a lot of other things that are happening before then. Yes, I do. I'm yep. curious because someone that's competing at the level that you're competing has, aside from training, your days are pretty like set out and there, there's a lot of routine that goes into it. So what does the first like 30 minutes of your day look like? First 30 minutes of my day are extremely boring. I <laughs> wake up, <laughs> I wake up, I get on my phone, I check my emails. Um, I go through the most important ones first, try to respond to anything that's really important. Um, 
get ready, go to practice. And then after my first practice, then it's come back and finish my emails. And where does eating fall into place here? Oh, eating is through all of that. (laughs) Eating. I am very passionate about food and eating. So I guess it's like, wake up, check my emails, eat, practice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) As we sit here now, a week out from the fight, how much weight do you have to cut? A week out, I think I'm 10 over right now. So, which is perfect. It's right where yeah. I want to be. It's not, it's not a lot of weight to cut anymore. I wanted to try to get my weight to a point that, um, in boxing, I didn't want to cut as much because you know, it's the like shots are pretty much just focused on your head and you know, I want to reduce the risk of concussion as much as possible. So I, I figured a lower water cut would be more important. Have you had concussions? I'm guessing, yeah. Actually, I don't know. No way. I've never been diagnosed with a concussion in my entire career. So, well, knock on wood right now. Yeah, knock on wood. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. it, yeah, I... it seems like it might, you know, at some point in your career, it might be a thing. You know, at some point, maybe I have. And I went to one doctor who was like, oh, yeah, I think you've broken your nose before because I like, deviated symptom. But I don't know. I never got diagnosed with a broken nose either. So, you know, I've been lucky. The only real fight injuries, I guess I got cut open under my eye and then I've broken my arm. So I've been very, very lucky. Do you think about life after fighting and what you want to do then? Yeah, I, I kind of do. I mean, or are you I, more like, I'm just going to think in the moment. I'm definitely more think in the moment. I, a long shot. I I know that I want to have kids, I guess, if that's like one part of it, I want to have kids, I want to, you know, travel the world. But those are all things that like, I I travel the world right now. I'm fortunate enough that my career has taken me all over the world. Um, Kids in seven to 10 years. And then, uh, (laughs) yeah, that's all I have planned for the future so far. The rest is just fighting. Seven to 10 years fighting some kids. We'll figure out the rest after that. Yeah, figure it out as it goes. You know, I mean, you don't really need to figure anything out after that. No, then I'm set. That's all that life has to it. Maybe play some Call of Duty and maybe you'll get into that. Maybe. I tried. I really did. I thought it would be a fun like pastime, but I would rather read my emails than play Call of Duty, honestly. So when he's playing Call of Duty, you're reading emails or what is it that you do? Yeah, I read my emails, actually put together our blogs for YouTube. It's Yeah. Are you editing it. those yourself? I edit them all myself. Wow. Thank you. So you can actually see as the timeline goes on that I'm slowly getting better at it. Um, so I'll edit, edit videos, try to get our vlogs ready. And it is really just passion for me. We don't really make money off of them or anything. So it's, it's just kind of fun. Well, not yet, but your channel is growing a ton. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we are. We're trying to grow the YouTube channel. I feel like, you know, people get an idea of who I am and who, you know, the life we live off of Instagram and off of social media, but that you get to see my real personality. Hmm. That's where you see me like in Alaska with my family. You get to see like day to day of a married couple of what it's like to be like married and professional fighters. Um, the coolest thing is I can get like up close and personal and film like Austin's weight cuts. And they're like real behind the scenes of fighting. And he needs to get better at filming me, <laughs> but we're getting there. Are you going to be vlogging the behind the scenes of your first BKFC fight? I am. I'm going to okay. try to oh, vlog right. and film, film everything. I can't guarantee that I'll, I, I'll get a video out before the fight. Um, I'm going to put one out on this Sunday, but um, it's just too much to try to edit and put together before the fight. So, But if he films enough, then we'll have some really good content for after the fight. But I don't think people realize what goes into making a vlog. It's all of the shooting. It's all like, then you got to put all the video into your, you know, into the system. Then you got to edit it all. Yep, it's a edit. lot of work and you've got I'm a lot going like on right now. Transitions. It's like a whole, and I really like, I'm, a per, they're not perfect, but I like to think I'm a perfectionist and I want to make them as good as possible. So the coolest thing actually that I'm doing right now is I've been taking a picture of myself every single day since I started dieting. And you can see the way my body transforms into the day of weigh-ins. Wow. And that's going to, that's actually really cool. I'm super happy that I actually did that because I saw, you know, people take videos of themselves, like losing weight. And this is exactly that. And you can see like the whole transformation of my body all the way up until fight night. It's crazy. So when are we going to see that? 
I think after weigh-ins. I'll probably post it after weigh-ins because that's kind of like the end point is showing like the weight cut of where, where you start and then how much weight you lose and what it looks like for weigh-ins and then and maybe I'll show fight day. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited to show that. It's kind of cool. Just people don't really show like how much your body transitions in a fight camp as a professional fighter. Like we go through a lot and our body like completely changes in like, you know, six to eight weeks. So that's going to be its own video when you put this out? Yeah, that'll be its this own gonna be video. Great. Yeah, just that. <laughs> Have you had any interest from like, so I live in Los Angeles now. Have you had any, in, any interest from like Hollywood or doing stuff out here? I mean, you did Chopped, you did Dance with the Stars. Do you like you're connected with the right people? I am. And you know what? There is interest here and there. And and I got, you know, an interest for like a movie and, and, and stuff like that. But um, first things first is fighting. And, and it has to coincide with my fight career. Um, there's little things I could get here and there. I have, I have an amazing management team. They're actually here in Florida too. So, um, once I put the pressure on them to do more like LA type stuff or yeah. TV work, they'll definitely get on it. But as I transitioned out of the UFC into professional bare knuckle boxing, I, I, I really wanted the last like six months to just be focused on getting my striking as good as possible. And they eliminated all the other noise. Is there a, someone's career in the movies and in movie industry that you look at and go, I would love to have a career like that person? Gosh, you know, and it seems like a, like just an easy go-to answer, but like, obviously I feel like I would fit me and the rock are like, you know, just kind of have the same pathway of going through like a, not con like, you know, he's WWE or the combat sports world and working our way up into Hollywood. I would love to have that kind of career like being so successful at his one career that it leads into an entire another career yeah well i mean it's been a long journey for him his first movie was like 2000 2000 2001 something like that it's absolutely amazing and now he's like one of the most well-known celebrities that you could ever think of he's also one of the nicest guys you could ever meet he's amazing That's awesome which i was supposed to actually i signed the contract to compete on his titan games yeah and i broke my arm right before and i couldn't be on the show and i was so bummed out well so you haven't met him yet have not met him in you're gonna have to be on next season that's i know that's what be i'll have to let my managers know all right i'm ready now <laughs> it'll be better you know you can be on next season when there's actually like fans there too Yes, I know. I would like to, once the, you know, everything calms down, I would love to be, have fans there to cheer everybody on. And I guess that kind of circles back to this fight. You're going to be doing this in, you know, relatively an empty arena. We Actually, there is going to be fans there. And in Florida, people are crazy here. It's like kind of like a no mask free for all situation. So yeah, right when my husband and I got here, we both got COVID very quickly and we're we wear our masks everywhere and we try to do I mean we don't go anywhere except for our house or our apartment in the gym so Florida's kind of a free-for-all so I, I do believe there's going to be a fan fans there so there's going to be fans there but this isn't going to be like the packed crowd that there would no, be you know that's a year ago. True. yeah and I, I maybe that doesn't I, I guess you don't I don't do you even hear the fans when you're fighting definitely do definitely yeah. do for me I do I was in the middle of um gosh a fight maybe it was with Felice Herrig and she hit me and it like was really loud and then everyone's like ooh, and like does this like ooh, and then I'm like it's not that bad it didn't hurt and like you want to talk back to him and be like oh you guys don't know what you're talking about I'm fine um but yeah you definitely notice the fans so as someone who used to live in Florida to someone who currently lives in Florida what is your greatest Florida story that you've come across so far? Cause Florida's a bit strange. Florida's a little bit strange, um, you know, but I will not, I will say Florida's not, I don't think Florida's as strange as Portland, Oregon. And I haven't wow. seen absolutely anything as, well, we're, we're only in Coconut Creek. So we don't get down to like Miami where, you know, it can get a little bit hairy. Uh, so where we are at here in Florida is not as wild as Portland, Oregon. And that's why it's keep Portland weird because Portland is a weird city. <laughs> have you seen an alligator yet? We have not seen an alligator Oh, we got to change this. But the lizards, there is lizards just The iguanas. Out. Yes, that are huge. And they're that's everywhere. Weird. They're everywhere and that's, they're a little bit weird. 
Yeah, I, I had a I had a pool, and the iguanas would just go to the bathroom beside my pool all the time. Yeah. Like what? Uh, what's going on here? Well, and I've seen like two of them just fall out of a tree. Like they're huge <laughs> iguanas, and they just fall and like splat on the ground, and then just run away, totally fine. They, they're crazy. Wow. They're absolutely crazy looking. They're like dinosaurs. They are like dinosaurs, and then they fall out of trees when it's too cold. Isn't that it? That's what I, yeah, I think that's what it is. When they get too cold and their body temperatures, they're almost like, um, yeah, their body temperature is too yeah, cold to, yeah. We're not scientists here. We don't no, know. No, I am not. <laughs> but they're I've, weird. I will say they're weird. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this page. And I'm so excited to see you in your first bare knuckle boxing fight. Like, I'm very excited to see what happens here. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. And I hope everybody tunes in. It's a, definitely a big deal transitioning over to a new career for me. Um, it's the first of many, so I, I'm really excited. Yeah. And I think people think that there's more of a transition, like there's more similarities than there are differences, but it's probably the opposite way. There's probably more differences than there are similarities. It's a big difference. It's taken away, you know, my, um, best quality, I would say as an athlete and made me really focus on like the details and the technique and really grind down and focus on, on the basics. And I feel like I've really done that. And I, I do think it's going to show off in this fight. Your positivity is so infectious. I love Thank this. You. And <laughs> I, I'm someone who leads with gratitude in my life. So I end every interview by asking you, what are three things that you're grateful for in your life right now? Oh my gosh. They, three things I'm grateful for. Um, really grateful for my team. I have a very big one. It's my family. I'm grateful for my management team, my business managers, my coaches, my teammates. Um, the way that even my teammates have just absorbed and loved me since I've come to American Top Team has been amazing. Um, I don't know. Maybe that was like four things, but I'm grateful for life. I'm grateful for this new opportunity. Um, it's just, yeah, lots of things to be happy about. Just so much gratitude. I love it. Yes, so much. <laughs> thank, thank you for bringing the positivity. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. No, I appreciate you.